quick non-scientific poll here. Who here desires for God to bless them? Anybody desire for God to bless them? Most of us. Some of us don't care. That's okay. They may be saying, I don't want God to bless because I know what's going to come next. Because my next sentence would be, then we must fight until the Lord has enough. Not until we've had enough. That's what we learn from Jacob. That's the way that to receive God's great blessings in life. Jacob found that out. He found it out the hard way, right? We sometimes also have to find out the hard way. That in order to receive God's blessing, the greatest blessings in life, we have to fight for it. And we have to fight God for it. And we have to fight God for it until God has had enough, not until we have had enough. Which doesn't really seem fair, because God is eternal. Right? And we are not. And God is strong, and we are weak. This is what Jacob had to find out. This is what we tend to have to find out. But the greatest blessings often come in a match with God. Jacob is going, uh, or has gone, since last week we were talking, you know, he was going down to his, uh, his grandfather's, his ancestor's place, in order to find a wife and escape from his brother who was seeking out to kill him. And some time has gone by. In fact, a uh, while down there, he of course meets a man by the name of Laban, who has two daughters. Uh, uh, he has one that's not really nice looking. Uh, the, the way that the Bible describes her is that her eyes were not pretty, uh, which either meant that she had a lazy eye or, or a cross eye, or, or maybe it's just like because that was the picture of beauty, right? You remember the pharaohs and, and, and such at this time? They would all do their uh, eyes and, 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 uh, and all this makeup to bring attention to their eyes. And, and so Leah was her name. She didn't seem to have pretty eyes. Rachel was beautiful. And so in the end, of course, if you go back and read the story, or if you read the story before, you understand that Jacob said, I will work for seven years in order to marry Rachel. At the end of seven years that he has worked and labored in order to win the hand of Rachel, Laban actually tricks him, right? Pulls a Jacob on him, deceives him, and gives him Leah instead. And then, after a week, you know, J Jacob's really angry, and, and so Laban says, hey, just finish out the uh, ceremony, and then at the end of the week, after the ceremony is done with Leah, and the wedding is done actually with Leah, then I'll give you Rachel, but in order to keep her, you have to work another seven years. And so Jacob does that. And so in that process, he of course not only marries then uh, Leah and then Rachel, but he then, because Leah doesn't seem to be able to, uh, well, Leah has a couple of kids, but then she seems to not conceive, and Rachel can't conceive, and so, so they give Jacob their main servants in order to have children by, and then finally uh, Rachel is able to conceive, and Leah conceives some more, and so all, all, about, all, all about the time this happens, he has 11 kids. And if you do the math, like these kids, I think, are all, 11 kids, like all in the age of 9 or so. There's a lot of kids in the age of 9. And Jacob's had enough, and so he has He's had enough of his father-in-law. He's had enough of that life. His father just, his father in law just keeps uh, aggravating him and changing rules on him. And, and he leaves with his two wives, his handmaids, his 11 kids, and the wealth that God has given to him through it all. And, and we see, you know, at this time, what we're looking at is that God is blessing him, but not with the blessing. Right? This, is, this is probably what we would call a general grace of God. Right? The general grace of God is that he, he, he lets it rain on the just and the unjust, on the believer and the unbeliever. They each have food to eat generally. Right? That is, there's nothing special about this grace that, that he just has a family and he is a good husband and he is a good father and, and, and he's a successful businessman. This is a general grace of God that's being bestowed on him. He's blessing him. And he's blessing really anything that his hands has touched. But there is one specific special blessing that Jacob has not yet received. And in order to receive it, Jacob ends up having to fight for it from God. So this morning, as we look at 
at that moment in Jacob's life, we see that it is a physical struggle that Jacob's going through. But we can take what Jacob went through physically and apply it to our lives spiritually. This is what we would tend to go through in our spiritual lives. So we take those principles that we see in this episode and apply them to ourselves in our very own existence. So first, what we need to look at is solitude. And when there is solitude in Jacob's life, we see that there comes a struggle. And then after that struggle, we see that he is soliciting a blessing from the Lord that we're going to talk about. And then finally, after the solicitation, we finally see that there is salvation for Jacob. So there is, what were they? Do you guys remember? Sol solitude. And then? Not yet. Don't forget about the struggle. Struggle. And then soliciting. And then ultimately, there is the salvation. So the first thing that we see and notice in this episode is that uh, uh, Jacob finally, probably, maybe, besides that point going down, this is like the time that he is alone. Look at me real quick, verses uh, 22 to 24, beginning of 24. The same night he, he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children to cross the fort of Yabok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. So by this time, by the time we read these verses, or what we see in these verses is that Jacob is sending all of his stuff ahead across the, the river of Yabok, the, the ford or the stream, whatever, however you want to. Uh, look at it, but, but he's, he's sending all this stuff, and, and he's already sent some of that to Esau in order to present a gift to Esau, because Esau is on his way. This is the whole you know background of this story. Esau's on his way. Jacob's terrified that Esau is still looking out to kill him, so he is trying to pay off his brother. He stole his brother's birthright. He stole his brother's inheritance, and so, hey, maybe perhaps all, that, all these thousands of camels and, and goats and such that he is sitting on, maybe that's just in payment. Right here, this is what you are owed. This is what I took from you. Here you go. Please don't kill me. He sent some of that across already to, to Esau. But then he wakes up in the middle of the night, and now he is sending the rest of his possessions across, along with his wife, uh, his wives, and, and his children, and really ultimately his concubines, if we consider them. Right? He gets up in the middle of the night and does that, takes them across the river of the boat. He returns back to his camp alone. And that's the point. He's alone. There's solitude there. Like we saw last week when we were looking at Jacob's life, when he was alone, and he set up a stone to lay down on this head on, God showed up. So we see again, Jacob is alone. He is away from family. He is away from all the noise. He is away. He is all by himself. And he is alone. And once again, we're going to see, God shows up. Well, I, well, I believe that the canon of Scripture is closed. And I do not believe that we receive any more prophecies from God do believe there are times where God and his child can experience a special moment together, you could say, and experience together. And we can't count on experiences, right? We can't, we can't you know, just, just leave everything for experience, but experiences with God, special experiences with God, remind us oftentimes of who God is, that he is in control, that he is sovereign, that he is glorious, that he is wonderful, that he is majestic, that he is holy. They remind us of those aspects, those, those attributes of God when we have those special moments. And I, I remember one, and I think I've shared this before, uh, and in fact I remember two, uh, real quick, that I have experienced in my life. Um, and, and one was uh, when I was 18, I think I've ex uh, explained this before, that, that I was gone on a mission trip which was probably not anything that even resembled a mission trip, but that's what they call it. And, uh, and so we were gone on a mission trip, and, and, and one night, the, uh, the, everybody in, that went, there was some, uh, I don't have any other idea, there were like dozens, it seemed like, maybe, maybe two dozen um, kids, teenagers, 
and a few adults, and almost every single one of them decided to leave one night and just go do something. I had no idea where they went. They asked if I wanted to go. I said, no, I'd rather not. And they left. Maybe two or three of us, I had graduated by that time, so they weren't like leaving a kid alone. But maybe two or three of us were left behind. And I just wandered off and just went. I heard a stream going by and it caught my attention, so I went to that stream. And, and there, just it was beautiful. The moon was shining and it was gleaming off of the stream. And it was so bright. And there happened to be a log sitting up right there. It's like a place for people to just sit there and rest. Oh, okay. I just sat down. And I spent some time there, just, just alone, in solitude. And then, and, and then over the, the, the whole scene of the, the, the crickets and the, the bird, it's just all, right? Just overcoming. Couldn't help it. I just started singing, not as loud as I could hear. But I started singing. How great that are. Because it was just a reminder of what God has done in his majesty and his glory. And just this feeling, not one of the feelings, but this feeling came over me. Just a, a calm and peace. Something that I really felt sensitive. <clears throat> Within 24 hours, I was on my way home. Got a phone call that next day. My dad had a heart attack. He died. And two deacons came from our church to pick me up. We drove seven or eight hours. And all I could think about on the way home was the previous night. Where God had reminded me that He is in control, that He is majestic, that He is glorious, and no matter what, no matter what, He will always be that way. Second time I had shared as well, I'm going to go deep into that, but Katie had a miscarriage, and she had to have the DE, and, uh, there I was again, all alone, right? Family in Wisconsin, family in Georgia. I have no earthly idea where anybody else was that was in our church. I don't know if it just happened so quickly that we just didn't even have the time to tell anybody. I don't know. I was alone. And I didn't know what to do. I was just feeling lost, helpless. And I opened up Psalm 46. Oh, I love Psalm 46. I have ever since. To me, once again, reminded that he is in control, that he is majestic, that he is glorious, that he is sovereign. Some of us are aching to have an experience with God. But we will not get along with him. We have too many things that we need to get done, want to get done, think needs to be need, needs to happen. And we allow busyness to overtake our lives rather than solitude. In fact, most of us probably don't like to be alone. And if we are alone, we do not like Silence. So we turn on the radio, we turn on the television, we turn on something in order to have background noise because we don't like being alone, we don't like to think that we are alone, we don't want to be in silence. And so we create noise rather than just receive the noise or receive the silence, receive the solitude in order to hear from God. I'm not saying every time that we're alone and every time that, we are, that things are silent that we are going to hear from God or that we are going to have an experience with God. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that for the most part, the way that God works, He works in silence and He works in solitude. Not always, but many times. So here's Jacob. He was alone at Bethel when he has the dream. God stands next to him. He's alone here in Peniel. But it's not just Jacob. 
Moses was alone and he spoke with God at the burning bush. He was alone and he received a law from God. Gideon was alone when the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him. Elijah was alone when God took him and, and showed him the whirlwind and the fire and, 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 and the, the earthquake and all. And then, right? And he says, that's not me. Hear my still small voice. Of course, we know that Jesus was alone many times with God in prayer. And Paul was alone in the desert for three years learning the Lord. John was alone on the Isle of Patmos when Christ appeared to him. Again, I'm not saying that there is more revelation to come. Don't get me wrong, right? I am saying there are times when we need to be alone with God. What I'm saying is that more often than not, one needs to be alone with God if one is to be transformed by his power. Because after that night, alone with God, Jacob would never be the same. Solitude is necessary in our Christian walk. But it's not just solitude that was going on. There was also a struggle that was happening. So that can happen when we get alone with God. There's just going to be this, this struggle because when we are alone with God, we are also alone with ourselves, right? And God, the Holy Spirit, begins to reveal some of those things that are deep down in us that we don't want to deal with anymore. That we've tried to shut down. That's why we tend to not want to be alone. That's why we turn on the radio and the, and, and the television. Because we don't want to be able to think about the things that are really are important. The things that really do matter. We don't want to think about our sins. We don't want to be able to deal with them. And so there's, but, but, but when we get alone with God, there's often this struggle that happens. A fight breaks out. This is exactly what happened with Jacob. So go back to 24. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Right? <laughs> so God's not playing around here. They're wrestling. Right? Jacob's not looking at this as a game either. He is in the fight for his life. And they're going at it. God is putting Jacob through the ringer, right? And in fact, God tends to put all of us through the ringer. We, we may be able to sit, say it like this, that, that he puts, us, puts our feet to the fire. He actually puts us in the fire. He, he gives us trials. He gives us struggles. We use the word trial, and, 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 you know, and do we ever stop to think about what that means? As if we're in a courtroom and we are being proven either innocent or guilty. We are, we are there, right? If anybody saw, and I'm not making any comment on it, but if anybody saw the Kavanaugh hearings this past week, right, when they met on Thursday, and, 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 and right, and, and he was in the fight of his life, for his life. This, this is a big deal. As it was before. It was a big deal to her. It's a trial. I mean, it wasn't technically supposed to be a trial, but that's basically how it was. That's how it was being run. And God tries us. He, he proves us. Jacob's fighting for survival. He understands that. I think, I think we forget that. That we are in a fight for our lives. We are in a fight for our spiritual lives. And we know that Jacob knew that because of his, his, his comments in, in verse 30. Uh, in verse 30. So Jacob called the name of the place to kneel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And yet I am saved. You don't see God face to face. Even Jacob knew that you cannot, no one can, can stand to see God face to face and live, and yet here he is, fighting God face to face, wrestling with him, and yet he has been delivered. He didn't die. In our modern church, we, we tend to make much uh, the, the, the Christian life much more surreal, more, much more dreamlike. Right? That, that when we come to Christ, everything's supposed to be great and wonderful. And, and then really, we, you know, we should have you know, peace and, and joy and, and comfort. And, and we should never really have to deal with any type of real hard struggles too much. 
Right? We shouldn't have our, our joy and our peace interrupted by struggles. And we have this idea that it should be okay. And when all of a sudden it's not okay, we, we mentally will know that. But in our hearts, we're still wondering, like, what in the world is going on? How come things aren't okay? There's going to be struggles. We don't need to just put that in our minds, in, our, in the forefront of our minds. We need to put that in the forefront of our hearts. But there will be struggles. This dreaming life is not the life that, that Paul experienced. It wasn't the life that he expected other Christians and other churches to experience. In fact, he tells the Colossians that he, he's praying for them. And one of the things that he's praying is that they would be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. You can look at Colossians 1, 1 11. He says, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all, for all endurance and patience with joy.
point. God used more might than Jacob was able to handle on his own, but not more than he himself had to go against himself. In other words, God gave Jacob the power to overcome and to reveal the rest. And he does the exact same thing with us. Go back and think through scriptures for a moment, right? Because we tend to often think that God's not going to give us, you know, and, and we know this again, we mentally will assent to this, right? That, that God's not going to give us more than we can handle. We know that's a lie. We know that's just completely false. It's a lie straight from hell. We understand that, right? That's what I hope you do. God absolutely always gives us more than we can handle. Because he does not want us using our might. He wants us using his might. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. Just go back and read the Bible, right? Moses, Moses, I, I want you to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth, the most powerful army on earth, and I want you to deliver a couple million people from him by just telling him to let them go. Perhaps a little bit more than Moses was able to handle. Gideon, Gideon, I need you to let go thousands and thousands from your army so that you only have about 300, and I want you to go and face the Midians who have the Midianites who have thousands and thousands in their army, and I want you to defeat them a little bit more than probably Gideon could handle. I mean, Gideon was afraid to set or to uh, knock down the the bales. In the daylight, he had to do it in the evening, nighttime, when everybody was asleep, he was asleep. God is constantly asking us and, and, and giving us trials and, 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 and wrestling against us, and, and we're struggling against things that we cannot handle. Elijah, I want you to go and face the 400 prophets of Baal and challenge them to a duel. 400 against one. It's constant. This is what he does. But whether we believe this mindset or not, it is infiltrated into our beings. It's so ingrained in us that usually we won't even attempt to do what we are not able to handle on our own. Definitely not what God, only God can do through us. But Jacob was able to prevail against God using, only by using, God's power. God condescended his strength to be more than Jacob could bear, but turn and also gave Jacob supernatural strength in order to win. And that's how he does it with us, too. So we will receive strength to fight the trials that God has given us as we fight with endurance and as we fight to the end. So we go quick to James. Chapter 1. Verses 2. Let's go through, through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. It's full effect. It's mature effect. It's perfect. It's perfection. That you may be perfect. You may be perfect. You may be complete. You may be mature. Lacking in nothing. The, the idea there is to get all the way to the end. We are not yet as mature as we are supposed to be. We are not yet as perfect as we are supposed to be. We are not yet complete in this walk. And, and, and so, so here, here, count it all joy. God's giving you these trials, and He is giving you the ability to overcome these trials so that you can be steadfast in your faith, so that you can continue on all the way until the end. Jacob endured to the end of this fight. He prevailed over God by God's own power. And as he did... We see that God touches him on the hip. Touches him 
on the hip, and his whole hip goes out of joint. If God wanted to, he could destroy him, right? I mean, he could be Thanos, right? Boom, and he's gone. But he doesn't. How many of you have actually seen him anymore? Okay, so like three of you got five of you. Right? He just snapped his finger. Jacob's dead. Jacob's gone. Just by a mere touch, his head gets put out of trouble. And he walks with a limp for the rest of his life. Constant reminder of the struggle that he had. He's gone. But God didn't want to kill him. He wanted Jacob to be strengthened, not in body, but in spirit. Which is why God asked to be let go. Go back to verse 26. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Again, this is this is bodily to the mind when we think about who God is, we think about who Jacob is, right? Is it possible for Jacob to restrain God from leaving? No. Right? I mean, first off, God is spirit. He is showing up here as a man. He is showing up, what we would call a theophany. He's showing up as a man. God can just disappear. He's no longer there. Nobody can stop him from just disappearing. Especially Jacob. So here is God. And he's saying to Jacob, let me go. The day is breaking, let me go. I need to get out of here, right? But Jacob's like, no, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. God was sitting around again, just to see he didn't use all of his might. God's also just kind of sticking around here because he knows not just what Jacob wants, but he knows what Jacob needs, and he knows what Jacob is longing for, and that is blessing. So let me go. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Jacob did not struggle all night with God, only to let him go for nothing. He wanted, he needed, he longed for a lesson that will not let you go unless you bless me. God could have said, yeah, you don't make it worse. But instead, he will bless me. He blesses him. Just Calvin says concerning this passage. Right? He says, this passage teaches us always to expect the blessing of God. Although we may have experienced his presence to be harsh and grievous, even to the disjointing of our members. It seems far too often we want a blessing. In fact, we probably even know that we need a blessing from God. But we don't ask God for those blessings. We may not be willing to fight for it. We may just simply not be willing to ask for it once the struggle is over. But we should. In fact, we must. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. I said uh, on Facebook that it's but this is probably my favorite quote from Spurgeon. It's a long one. Probably my favorite quote from Spurgeon that I've ever found, ever read. He says, Some people, when they pray, are like little boys in the street who give runaway knocks at the door. Off they go. But the man who prays a right gets a hold of the knocker of the door of mercy, and he knocks and knocks. And if there is no answer, he knocks again and again. And if there is not an answer, he knocks again and again. And if not, then an answer. He knocks again and again and again and again and again. And the longer he is kept waiting, the more loudly he knocks, till at last 
you would think he was going to carry the house by storm and make the doorpost start out of their sockets. He knocked so hard. That is the kind of man who wins the day with God. The man who will not let the Lord go until he blesses him. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. This is a promise that Jesus is given. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The question is really where we go in. Will we wrestle it from God through those trials and through prayer in order to obtain the blessing that He has for us? Will we struggle and will we go into our closets of solitude where we are alone with God and seek God's blessing even if it takes us through the night, even if it takes us through a week? a month, a year. God will give us good things. Give us the blessing. He will do it because we are His children. He is our loving and gracious Father. Surely as God blessed Jacob, He would bless us. You want to throw this caveat in there? We can't just simply ask for any and everything. I expect you guys to be mature enough to know that. God is not a genie, but He does seek to bless us, and He has blessings for us, and many of them we have to fight for. So it's just as surely as God blessed Jacob, he's going to bless us. And we see that it's not just the promise of Jesus, but it is also in the promise of Paul. And go to Romans 8 if you want to. I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, He didn't, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So we go back to Genesis chapter 32. We see here, verse 27 and 28. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So we go back 14 years or so, right? When God met Jacob at Bethel and he goes down to his hometown or his town of his ancestors. God has promised that he would, in that dream, that he would go and he would be with them always, that he would be with them when he goes and he will bring him back. And so now we see that he's on his way back. He's been with them the whole time. He hasn't left him for a moment. But now as he's on his way back, God is not allowing Jacob to stay the same person that he once was. No longer would Jacob be a supplanter. No longer would he be a heel grabber. No longer would he be a deceiver. 
from now on will be his rule. One who has striven or wrestled with God. He came out victorious. He prevailed. So we need to, we need to understand this, right? We must not think that because we struggle with God, that God has abandoned us. It is in fact the opposite. He is closer than ever, making us what he always planned us to be. God was no closer to Jacob than when he was resting. When I speak of salvation here, please understand I'm not just talking about justification. Right? I think that's probably what we see here with Jacob is this justification going on, that he has become a new creation at this point. I'm not just talking about justification, I am talking about sanctification. That we are becoming what God has already declared us to be, that we are being that we are becoming more and more like Christ. We are growing up in our, in our faith. Talking about glorification. We are getting ready to, you know, make a are just on the precipice. And so there are some of us here that, that are not yet believers, that, that are struggling with God, and there are some of us that are struggling with God, and we are believers, but we're struggling for holiness, and we're struggling for, for, for new mercies every morning. We are struggling over and over again, and we are trying to become more like Christ. We want to become more like Christ, but we're struggling with some temptation. We're struggling with some trial. We're struggling with this or that. And there are some of us that are struggling God over glorification because we are on the precipice of meeting him in glory. He is preparing us. We're having a hard time. So when I use the word salvation, I'm using it in its fullest sense. See, Jacob would never be the man that he once was. I say that he didn't sin, doesn't say that he, you know, we see that he sins again. Not that he's perfect, but he's more like Christ. He is more like the God who is blessing him. His soul has been saved. God says, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob. You're no longer tied to that name, right? You're no longer that person that you once were. You are a different person. You are a changed person. You are blessed by God Himself. You know, after you once were. Sounds a lot like what Paul said to the Corinthians, right? First Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says there in the 6th, 9th, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. This is who you used to be. You will no longer be called Jacob. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Not who you were. You were. You're no longer who you used to be. You are a new man. You are a new woman. Change. Be different than you used to be. Paul said in the second letter to the Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You are blessed by God Himself with a new identity in Christ. Remember the Beginning, we talked about the river in the oak. We didn't get into it very much. But Moses, in his writing, this is actually, he's using, he's, he's doing a, a thrice pun, you could say. Three puns here. Because the word, the river, the oak, that he sent his family across and came back, there to be in solitude, 
sounds almost exactly like the word that he uses for struggle or wrestle, which is abok. Which almost sounds exactly like Jacob's actual Hebrew name. You switch the, the, the K and the, and the B around and you have Yaakov. And so here we have Jacob at Yaakov, having a book with God. So Yaakov at the Yaakov, a book, a book. It's a tongue twister. It really is. Right? And it was meant to be. He wants the people that are reading this, he wants his, his original readers, the people that are there in the wilderness and, and going into the, the, the promised land, he wants them to be able to know that something amazing is about to happen here to Jacob, to Yabok. Or I'm sorry, Yakob. See, it's a it's a right there. While at the Yabok River, Yakob awoke with God. And the sun came up. Came over the horizon. Due to Abok. Yep. Due. I'm having a hard time here. Due to Abok. Yakob. This river changed. So while not explicitly said, Go into chapter 33, we see that Jacob is with his family, which means he crossed back over the yellow. Having gone through the struggle, he came out a new man. A new morning, a new man. Crossing the river, everyone saw it. Morning and evening, dawning of the sun, the dawning of Israel. But it all happened after the all both after the struggles. And only seen after crossing the Yabok. In verse 29. Then Jacob asked, asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name, there he blessed him. A lot of people would say that he was Jacob again, going back to his old ways, trying to supplant, you know, trying to be the number one. He got a blessing from, from God, and now he's trying to do something for God and learn his name and give him a blessing. I don't think that's what it is at all. We, I think he's just simply clarifying. He, he's already met God. He knows who God is. He's not asking God. Because he doesn't know, he knows who God is. He has met God in his dream, standing next to him back at Bethel. And God has already given his name. He said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac. In fact, Jacob at Bethel says, Yahweh has been in this place. So he says, Tell me, tell me, confirm. I mean, I see you face to face. I can. What is your name? Confirm it. And God's looking at him saying, Do I really need to tell you my name? Are you really doubting? You, you know. Jacob's so sure that he knows the name of God that he changes. Not only does his name change, but he changes the place where he has met God again. He changed the land, the name of the land that he wrestled on. Look at verse 30 and 31. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, which is a stuff, derivation of Peniel, limping because of his head. He knew who he was. He names the place, knowing that he has met God. There are some struggling again, like I said, with God at this very moment. Some of you are simply struggling to believe what he says about salvation. Sounds too good to be true, sounds way too easy to be right. Some of you are struggling in areas of addiction. And God's been coming at your heart to be it up and cling to him. Some of you are struggling 
for life in general, right? It's just not going like you thought it was supposed to go, not like you think. And you're having a hard time. It seems like God's abandoned you. Some of you may be struggling with control. I mean, you know, on one hand, God is in control, but He's sovereign. On the other hand, I need control over this area or maybe even these areas of my life. Some of you may be struggling with health issues. Cancer. Diabetes. Or insomnia. Or chronic pain. And God has placed these trials, He's placed these struggles in your wrestling with them. And night after night, day after day, you're seeking to win the battle, but it's just too much. You can't handle it. What do you do? You've been asking for relief, hoping that God is going to relieve you of this, and you've been asking for deliverance, and hoping that God is going to deliver this, deliver you from this, and you are receiving neither relief nor deliverance. You're wondering what's up. Perhaps you're fighting with your own strength, and you kind of already knew that. But if that's the way it is, if you are, then understand you will not last. Until dawn. When God is at dawn. Paul was like that. Paul says to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about how God sent a messenger from Satan. How nice of him, right? To be a thorn in his side. That he has asked. For this thorn to be removed over and over again. In fact, the, the word that he uses is harassing. It actually means that we can understand why he's like a thorn in the side. Because it actually means to strike. As in like to punch. With the hand. This time, struggling, wrestling, fighting. He's asked God over and over again for deliverance. Until he finally realizes that it is not deliverance that he needs. What he actually needs is God's blessing. God's strength. God's grace. To continue on, go with me second Corinthians. We're almost done. I know it sounds trite because we read this all the time. We, we like to quote it to each other and we give it absolutely no thought. But it is true. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, my power, there's a strength, right? My power is made perfect in weakness. You can't do this, Paul. You are too weak. You will not last until dawn. It is my power that is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ that I am content. I am content. I am happy. Happy to be weak. I am happy. I am content with my weaknesses. Insults. Hardships. Persecutions. And calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because it's not me that's strong. It's God's power with Strengthened with all power according to his glorious life for all endurance and patience with joy. May we learn to fight with God's, like God, with God's own power. Fight with his grace and with his glorious strength. <clears throat> and so receive the blessing that he has for us, whether that's be Christ in us, because we do not yet know Christ, Christ in us, or more of Christ in likeness in us. We have four takeaways and we're done. And I apologize for going over. Number one, 
Get alone with God. Turn off the phone. Turn off the television. Turn off the radio. Turn off all the noise. And just sit there. Be still. And know that he is God. And that you are God. Number two. God's blessings are good, but often difficult to receive because they must be one. Go back and read in Revelation 1 and 2, which Jesus has said to the, or excuse me, 2 and 3, which Jesus has said to the seven churches there. To the one who conquers, this will happen. They must be one. Blessings of God sometimes happen. Number three, don't waste your struggles. Ask God to grant a blessing because of them. In your struggles, in my struggles, we will never be the same person that we were when we were before those struggles ever happened. Why waste them? Why not ask God, hey God, in this blood, in this struggle, in what I am going through, in this heartache, in this pain, will you bless me that I may not just be a different person in general, but be a different person for your glory? Israel walked with a limp for the rest of his life. And when you're done with your struggle, you will walk with a limp as well. But by God, ask God to bless you through it. And because of it, Ask him to bring about the fruit of your struggle. Bless them. There will be a day when we will all be at the meal. There will be a day when we will find our Savior and see our Savior face.